Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So my intention with today's uh, talk is really to give folks uh, some perspective on um, some of the market dynamics in the biopharmaceutical industry and, and also um, some of the relevant advances that are being made in manufacturing technologies to be able to address um, some of the, the pressures that exist. And so the, the, uh, the, main, the main thrust will be um, continuous processing. And uh, just to begin, this is a summary slide um, of, of, of me and my um, academic background, as well as um, the, the current job role that I have. Uh, feel free to connect on, on LinkedIn um, afterwards as required. Okay, so this is the menu for today's talk. And um, I'll begin by giving uh, the, the audience a brief introduction to AstraZeneca that is um, you know, background to the company and, and um, so salient information on, 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 on it. Uh, with that uh, in hand, we'll then move into uh, a piece around healthcare markets and some of the challenges um, with biopharmaceutical um, production and sales. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the manufacturing um, within the high-tech uh, industry of biopharmaceuticals. And, and how that is changing and challenges associated with that. We'll then move into um, some, uh, I guess, chemical engineering details around continuous manufacturing and, um, and, and what, what the current state of the art is in AstraZeneca. Then we'll, we'll step back and, and, and have, have a, you know, towards the end of the, the presentation, some, some philosophical perspective on how AstraZeneca remains competitive in the, the medium to long term in, in, in this technology space. And I'll wrap up with the summary of key points made. Okay, so what, what, what I intend uh, to get across with this slide is, is the idea that you know, AstraZeneca uh, has um, achieved scientific leadership and, and um, Sorry, Matthew, can I just very quickly interrupt? I'm not sure your slides are moving on. Right. Sorry, we still have the, the, um, the principal slide, the opening slide. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Seems to, to be a bit of a technical, technical issue. <clears throat> uh, I've, I've, I've tried to adjust the slides. What I can see on my desktop here, which, which I am sharing is, is um, the slides are changing. Um, are you still seeing the same? Yes, we still see the main one, um, the first introductory slide. I wonder if it's worth, if you stop sharing and restart sharing. Yeah, let's try, let's try that, that approach. Yes. Okay. And, um, controls. How are we doing? Has that made any difference? No, Matthew, I'm just going to stop your sharing there. Okay, so we can now see you on video. Do you want to try restarting up your PowerPoint uh, in presentation mode and, um, and then try sharing it again with us? Uh, okay. Ah, there, there we, we go. go. That looks All more right. like it. And we, can, we can now see your personal introduction screen. And is it, uh, has, has the slide shifted now? And yes. it's now moving, great. Oh, perfect, okay, um, right. Well, I won't go over that, that, that bit of information. Um, I'll skip to where, 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 I, where I left off. So here's a map of um, the main uh, sites in, in AstraZeneca. And it, it has really achieved uh, scientific leadership by um, co-locating its, its centers of excellence um in in global cl clusters for for um, biopharma so you can see in the in the blown up images there in gatesburg in cambridge and gothenburg we have um particularly large investments in gatesburg um we were very closely affiliated and, and located and uh, nearby to johns hopkins as well as um, the national institutes of health and of course in cambridge um which is which is the site of our headquarters there there are various other um, entities which we, we affiliate with. And in Gothenburg in Sweden, which many, many might not be familiar with, 
There is the Biocon, Bi, Bi, Medi, Medicon uh, Valley, as well as uh, the Karolinska Institute, where, where we do quite a lot of collaborative work. There are other satellite sites spread across the world, as you can see in the map. Within Cambridge, uh, what you can see here is the, the range of, um, of partners that we, we work closely with. Um, around 2,500 employees um, based, based on site and growing. And as, as I mentioned, it's the global, global headquarters um, for AstraZeneca. This uh, image here is intended to, to illustrate the main areas where, where, um, where AstraZeneca focuses, focuses its, its strategy. So to the left, we can see oncology, um, respiratory and immunology, and cardiovascular and renal metabolism as identified as the main therapy areas where, where our products are directed towards. You know, additionally, there are opportunistic investments in microbial sciences and products pertaining to neuroscience. And you know, our products span the full range um, of, of, um, of, of technologies as, as illustrated in the bottom um, of, of the image there from biologics, small molecules, immunotherapies, protein engineering, and devices. And what I, I intend, intend for you to get from this slide here is an idea that at least within biologics, there is um, a near constant um, evolution in terms of our portfolio. And to the left, you can see some schematics of, of different types of products, um, which, which are in our pipelines, uh, and of increasing complexity, by the way. So I, I guess in, in biopharma, a standard would be the monoclonal antibody, which is typically referred to as a MAB. And um, you know, this is changing. As you can see, see the MABs um, were the predominant modality in our, in our pipeline. And, and then we look to 2021, and the, the vast majority of products coming through, at least in biologics, are, are non-MAB. They're you know, complex molecules. And you know, the list keeps growing uh, you know, within our portfolio. We are looking at viral vectors, nucleic acids, cell therapy, you name it. OK, so uh, with that kind of background information to AstraZeneca uh, complete, we can now look at the, um, the healthcare market section, which I, which I prepared for you. So if you, if you think about um, the, the global spending on, on, on biopharmaceuticals and pharmaceuticals, we're looking at uh, in the end of 2020, around 1.27 trillion US dollars. And where that money is being spent is indicated in the, the top left um, schematic. Uh, the vast majority is, is spent in North America. It's approximately 50% of, of sales, at least in, in, in 2017. But there are other ma major areas where, where, where sales are made, including Europe and LATAM and, and, and Japan. And if you think about what, what types of um, indications are, are being targeted. You can, you can, you can see a, a brief breakdown in, in the top right-hand table from genetic diseases right down to ophthalmic disorders. And right next to it are some interesting figures around uh, the annual patient expenditures. So for instance, if we look at um, solid tumors in cancers, we can see estimates for the, the, the per patient um, annual expenditures, a, a low range of around 27K. Um, and this is US dollars, by the way, uh, right up to 220K. And so we can see there's quite a spread. Um, and, and some of these, these figures are, are substantial, right? Um, so in the case of some of these rare diseases, you know, there's a, a high spend there of um, 793K per year. So these, these sums are, 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 are very big sums. And so if we look at the graph at the bottom, the, the axes are quite small. It's something generated from um, a search that I did of the OECD um, databases. I, I, I was interested in, in um, looking at what percentage of, of GDP is, is, is spent on, on pharmaceuticals. And by and large, what you can see is an increasing, increasing trend over time. You know, in some cases, you know, the, the trend has been bulked notably in France and, and, and in the UK. But if we, if we look at um, the, the, the line, the blue line, which corresponds to the United States, it's, ha it's had a fairly um, uh, consistent increase over time. And, um, and that is, is something which has, has spurred a lot of interest and concern. And so the question is, you know, why, why is that happening? And, you know, a recent paper um, 
published by the Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development. Um, I, I found it um, particularly, um, I guess, instructive or informative in light of um, my perspective on, on costs. And you know, in, in, in industry, you can hear, you can hear, and in the media, you can hear quite a lot of um, speculation around what those costs are. But, but I'd advocate that um, the capitalized costs are around 2.6 trillion, sorry, 2.6 billion, not trillion. Uh, and this, this will happen over around eight years, approximately. And generally, the, the, um, the pipeline efficiency is around 12%. And, and so um, it's very challenging to get a, a product to, to market, a, a biologic product to market. Uh, the the pie chart to the right there is I generated that to kind of illustrate you know where where the costs are are incurred. Now the important thing to to recognize with this analysis was that or is that the it is fairly general it's based on a number of biopharmaceutical companies and what 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 has happened over time, and so obviously this isn't representative of every single product which goes comes to market, but it's still nonetheless quite useful. And it does tell a story of you know, substantial costs to bring a drug to market. The other paper that I, I found, which I think is really useful for, for folks to have, um, to, to read and to, to familiarize themselves with is, is a, re, a recent um, article in, in Nature produced um, by National, National Institutes of Health. Um, and essentially what they, what they tried to get across was um, a detailed map of all of the activities that, um, that, that were involved with bringing a, a, a product to market. And um, the, the detail schematic on the, on the right-hand side of the slide here is, um, tries to illustrate um, you know, what, what all those, um, th those activities would be. And what, what, the reason why I'm showing this to you is, is to illustrate a couple of things. The first is that there are many different activities that, that are involved. And it, you know, the, the, the schematic is colored because it represents different areas of expertise. So for example, you know, lead optimization is an area you know, in, involved in manufacturing technology, something that I'm involved with. Well, there are many other areas um, which you know, come to play and, and, and dominate the costs. And the other thing to, to bear in mind as well is you know, the, the way in which these products um, come to market uh, is, is not a sequential process. There is, there's a, 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 it's very dynamic. There's a lot of feed forward and feedback happening. So it's more like a, a web, which is, is, is constantly evolving. And, and, and that's something which I think is important for people to recognize and appreciate. And so I've, I've, I've produced this picture here to, to kind of illustrate um, a sentiment um, that, that I think many people might be familiar with, which is a sense that you know, society um, is, is uh, experiencing quite some strain to do with the, the, the costs and availabilities of, of, of medicine, uh, with one side pulling in one direction and the other side um, pulling in the other with, with, with respect to, um, you know, the, the pr production as well as consumption of, 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 of pharm pharmaceutical drugs. And what was interesting was this quote that um, I recently uh, extracted from a report from the US White House Council of Economic Advisors, which basically said, which you know, um, resonates with what I've, I've, I've illustrated to you earlier, which is that Americans pay more than 70% of the, the biopharmaceutical profits, but um, the United States only accounts for 34% of the OECD GDP. And you know their resolution is that the American drug prices, they, they, they should be re reduced. And uh, the, in the future, the, the price of the health um, should be reduced by specifically by lowering costs. And so, you know, this, this analogy is something that I'm gonna return to, but, but the, the, the point is, it's not so much that, that, that um, folks are trying to pull one another um, in, in over, over to a particular side, but rather I think that for, uh, both, both industry as well as patients and governments, um, they'd like to, to have a more comfortable environment to be in. To, and in, in order to find solutions, I think the idea is not so much to, to focus on pulling one another um, towards, towards uh, each other, but, but rather to think about, you know, what is the best way to, to get space? And I, I, to, to extend my analogy a bit, I've, I've, I've put knots in this um, rope, which, which folks have been tugging on. 
And I think um, the key really is to identify, you know, how to extend that rope to give folks more space. Um, and that essentially done by identifying what the knots are or where the knots are and, 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 and or the challenges and, um, and working together to undo them. In other words, to find win-win solutions. And when it comes at least to manufacturing, which again, is just a small um, proportion of, of the, um, the overall costs in that web that I showed earlier. What, what, I, can, what I can speak with authority on is the, the key challenges that I see. And you know, the, the, one of the main ones is the fact that there are very high stakes involved um, with, with um, uh, when to introduce improvements into manufacturing to, to lower costs. And this is because, as, as I mentioned previously, the products are very complicated. And, and what that means is that uh, you know, when, when you file a patent, you may, may get 20 years. If it takes eight years to get, to get a product to, to, to market, then you, you have a, a, a shortened duration of time in which to, to, to recoup those costs and, and hopefully deliver, deliver a profit and you know, maintain the business as a going concern. And so um, anything which um, potentially compromises the patent um, exclusivity period or erodes it, you know, uh, presents a severe risk to, to, to profits. And so, you know, folks are conservative because of this. And, you know, it, 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 introducing new technologies is something which can, can, can potentially jeopardize this, this, um, this state of affairs. The second challenge is around um, product attrition. And um, I say, I've put it here as fiscal prudence by executive management. But I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the average uh, um, you know, pipeline efficient around 12%, which means that there's quite a lot of sunk costs which businesses need to contend with, pharmaceutical businesses to contend with. And the, although the R&D costs themselves are a relatively small um, proportion, of, of expenditures. What, what, what I think is often forgotten is that the, the revenues which are, are tied to you know, products getting to market are well in, in advance in the future. And of course, those cash flows need to get discounted. And so when we, um, when we think about, in addition to that, the fact that you know, a, 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 a company may have multiple products with complicated dependency, cost dependencies within those, those products, what you see is uh, um, a, a arrangement which you know, doesn't have much room for, for failure. And so um, managers, executive managers are really conscious about, about that and, 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 and the tolerances that they need to, to stay within. And then finally, uh, the last challenge in, with manufacturing technologies I want to highlight is around exposure to vulner vulnerabilities to externalities. So the first major one is uh, the health authorities, the, the, the regulatory agencies, which you know historically have been very conservative, specifically um, anything to do with product quality, because of course you know um, the products which we 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 sell you know have the potential to impact um, health, and um, and and of course we need to to ensure and assure the, the public that they're safe. Um, and then the, the the other thing around externalities is around the the supply chains um, with these new technologies, right? So they, they, in many cases, the, the, the companies introducing the, the new um, efficient uh, manufacturing technologies, uh, they may well be small, small companies and they don't have the level of stability that is required really to, to, to ensure that our operations aren't impacted. And finally, the other piece around externalities is worth thinking about is, um, Pharmaceutical, global pharmaceutical supply doesn't happen you know, in isolation by a single company. It happens by a network of, of manufacturing plants spread around the world. And you know, these contract manufacturing organizations, many of them don't have the capabilities or the capacity to be able to, to push, push through um, you know, these, these, these new uh, manufacturing um, approaches. And so that needs to, to, to factor into to, to what, what happens um, when, we, when we're producing drugs. And so on to the topic of next generation manufacturing. So what, what does that look like? Well, at AstraZeneca, we really see it as um, significantly improved commercial production capability. And uh, predominantly what is done now is batch um, mode manufacturing where um, 
sequential steps uh, take place uh, to produce a, a product. It's purified and then put into vials yeah, and, um, and then sold. And normally it'll take around five years to build a new plant, get it qualified and operational and about half a billion dollars too. Um, whereas in the future, what we see um, being possible is you know, a single um, unit operation. So uh, not, not sequential steps of processing, a single um, mode of operation where, where product is, is produced much more efficiently. And you know, what we see is a cost reduction from 500 million down to around um, 200, 200 billion and time to bring that online um, around two years. And specifically, what, are we, what, what does that mean? Well, that means uh, a kind of um, convergence of a number of improvements, specifically the, the adoption and um, the heavy reliance on single use technologies and ballroom process design rather than um, the existing um, one, one, one um, approach, uh, which, which, which tends to predominate um, now. And the other big piece there on process intensification, and this is um, essentially involving integrating unit operations together. And finally, you know, when, once those operations are integrated together, the next um, uh, improvement that's really required to make that feasible is you know, online real-time monitoring uh, in, in quite advanced ways. So incorpor incorporating um, advanced tools such as spectroscopy um, and ensuring that, you know, once product, you know, vials are, are created that they, they, they can be, be shipped quickly without, without undue delay. And so now with, with that kind of background in place, dive a little bit deeper into what AstraZeneca is doing within this space. So, you know, as I mentioned, the batch approach involves um, a se sequential uh, mode of processing where, you know, why we can think about maybe, um, you know, creating a, a batch of, of um, pasta in the, in the kitchen where you might, um, step one might be to, to collect all your materials, mix them, cook it in a pot and eventually transfer it into a strainer. Whereas with the continuous mode, you essentially have one, one um, device, one, one piece of equipment that does everything. And this is where the, the, um, the improvement really is. Uh, but it, you, one might wonder why not go to continuous processing right from the very start. And that's because it's you know, far more difficult generally to, to accomplish. Um, you, things which are relevant um, for the transition um, concern, you know, equipment, is, is it, equi existing equipment even compatible? Is it able to, 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 to work? Uh, do, do we need to retool? Um, it, how, how complex is the operation? In biopharmaceuticals, sterile operation is key, for example. Uh, the, other, the other important thing in manufacturing generally is um, the, uh, bench, what's called a bench scale model, which allows you to examine and test out changes before you know, sticking them into operations. Um, you know, can this be scaled on demand when required? And, and, and do the health authorities, um, are there regulations preventing um, transition to, to, to continuous manufacturing? So these are the kinds of things that we, we need to think about. And the best example, um, I think, or the most classical example of continuous processing uh, is, is the, the um, continuous assembly line, um, which was... Uh, uh, I think one of the iconic contributions of, of the Ford, Ford Corporation. Uh, and what, what you can see here is um, one of those continuous assembly lines in action producing these black cars. And um, I went um, to this website indicated here um, on the slide, the hyperlink, and they have a really in intriguing story about you know, how that innovation came into, into play and, and what it what it meant um, for, for the business. And the arrow um, in the graph uh, indicates when the, um, the continuous assembly line was introduced. And what you can see is um, the costs um, maintained a fairly um, you know, more or less linear decline, but the um, production of units substantially, substantially increased. And that, um, and that is essentially the kind of improvement that's, that, that, that we're targeting um, in biopharmaceutical manufacturing. You might be interested to know what the, um, the dip there in the units was. And according to the story, I think there was a strike which took place because of um, changing working conditions. Um, but, but, but anyway, this is, I think, um, very instructive for us to keep in mind about where biopharmaceutical manufacturing is headed. And so, so, um, 
what you can see here is a paper which we published in 2018. It basically outlined you know, what our vision is of um, continuous manufacturing and you know, the next, next generation of manufacturing in biopharmaceuticals. And um, essentially what it involves is growing cells within a, a vessel. And we, we, we've termed it here a perfusion bioreactor. And attached to the bioreactor is, um, is a filter which retains the cells and, and allows the, the, um, the cell culture supernatant to be passed through to a purification chain in a continuous way. Um, the first step is, is, is what's called chromatography. Um, and that's then followed by something called viral inactivation to, to, to remove some of these um, potential contaminants. That then moves through to further chromatography and buffer exchange steps to, um, to eventually produce a highly pure product, which um, is efficacious and safe. And so we have become convinced um, of, the, of the following um, benefits of, of um, continuous um, uh, manufacturing at AstraZeneca. And the first is, you know, we're confident that it'll deliver, deliver us higher daily productivity. This is very important because I put here flexibility into me, high dosage, large target patient population demands, is that during, um, when you're bringing a, a product to, to market and when it's in the clinic often, you can get an expansion in the number of indications that are being pursued. You can get uh, expansion in the number of patient cohorts that are being examined in clinical trials. You can get expand, expanded numbers of patients just generally um, during the course of development. And so that then demands the ability to, to produce more material um, uh, really on the fly and, and, and continuous manufacturing um, really allows, allows for that. The next thing is around lowering the costs, okay, I put CapEx and OpEx costs. Um, we have found that at least with our assets really, um, minimal upgrading of existing technology allows us to, to achieve some of the benefits. The other big benefit is space, right? We've, um, we, we, we've, we've proven at least within, within our, our, our internal um, uh, sphere that um, the, the, what we can achieve with these, um, with this new approach is, is significantly superior to, to, to what we've done uh, previously. And finally, around product quality, um, because of the nature of the perfusion steps, so raw materials are continuously fed in, there, there are less impurities that, that get introduced um, by, for example, cells, that then um, does not have the impact on um, product, um, product quality as, as, um, as perhaps it would, would have otherwise. And, um, and so the impurities, specifically if you're trying to produce a product which um, is quite unstable, then um, maintaining that kind of pure environment is, 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 a, is a real benefit. And, um, and finally, scalability. Um, a big challenge with batch operations is, you know, how do you go from, you know, um, a, maybe a 15 milliliter bioreactor up to a 15,000 liter bioreactor and, and still maintain the right um, product, product um, operations uh, in terms of uh, quality, safety, productivity, cost of goods, et cetera. And so, so just to give you some perspective, so this is from actual work that, um, that we've done. Uh, you can see uh, what, on the, the graphs in, in the chat, draw a comparison of fed batch versus continuous. And uh, the first there you can see tighter per day. This is essentially tighter product. We've seen a um, you know, one, one, one to 1.7 um, increase in terms of the productivity, if you like. Um, and, and, and other parameters, which are, you know, diving into details around manufacturing, but essentially the cells that we're using are, are, are performing differently um, as well. And with regards to scaling, my point around scaling here, you're seeing some data around cell growth over time within the perfusion reactors. Um, you, you see in three liter runs compared against a uh, hundred liter perfusion run. And um, you can see some, some pretty good um, comparability, at least um, uh, within, within the field when, when this data was generated. Things are much tighter, tighter now, um, but you know, we're, we're confident with the, the level of reproducibility that we we're achieving. And, and again, the scalability is something which is pivotal for us. And finally, um, again, a schematic of the, the process for you. you know, what we're seeing is a, a 2K disposable uh, manufacturing plant 
and um, and processing train is you know we're able to get that to to, to deliver a productivity of a, a twelve thousand liter stainless steel plant, which um which is which is a, a phenomenal phenomenal um, achievement. And um, some perspective around uh, what what this means for costs. So um, I mentioned um, the 2K reactors um, able to perform or deliver the equivalent of, of a 12K reactor. Well, if you compare what's happening um, at the 2000 liter scale um, between batch and, and fully continuous, you can see a significant cost reduction there with, um, with the fully continuous, you know, uh, in, in pretty much um, the, the vast majority of the measures excluding um, materials, there's a, a reduction in terms of what, what, what the, cog, the cost of goods of manufacturing is um, at the 2K scale. But interestingly, when, when, you, when you look at the 15K scale, if you would, would seek to develop a fully continuous process, the benefits aren't that strong. And this is because of the, the, um, the change in terms of the economies of scale that, that, that exists. Uh, and what, what, what about the future for us? Well, there are many areas, it's a very fertile area for, for further improvements in terms of manufacturing and the, the medium that we use to grow cells in, the way in which we um, assess the, the desirability of the processes which we, which we run, um, how, how we, our ability to flex the properties of these new um, molecular formats is stronger in, in, in continuous manufacturing. That allows us to bring a, you know, more molecules to market um, looking at different um, ways in which we, we, we can um, steer, steer overall um, process performance. Um, the ability to incorporate next generation modeling, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and then eventually moving to truly continuous. Because in many cases, the, 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 the technologies that we use have um, continuous light prop, uh, properties, and the idea would be to to, to really develop that universal processing device that I, I spoke, spoke about earlier. And, um, and then finally, the idea would be to rather than have these single plants, large plants to have um, multiple small scale plants or small scale disposable facilities, and rather than scale up and get multiple, you know, big get reactors which are bigger and processing trains which are bigger and bigger, think about scaling out. So you know, essentially replicating multiple 2K installations. So many, many areas to, to, to think about for future development. And so for just to, to, we're in the last proportion, portion of the presentation now, and I wanna talk a little bit about strategically um, how, how to maintain that edge, at least um, how, how I, I think AstraZeneca has gone about um, leading uh, the industry. And I think back to some of the time I spent in, in business school and um, some of the lectures around strategy of innovation where, um, Clayton Christensen's work around S-curves was mentioned. Uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the continuous manufacturing is, is really coming towards the end phase of that S-curve to the extent that it is, um, is quite, quite mature. And one of the things that AstraZeneca does um, really well, I think, is, you know, gradually as, as technology moves from architectural, disruptive and radical and routine, you know, uh, up through the S-curve, the, the, over time, the, the, there's a gradual and increased investment in, in, in terms of uh, maintaining and owning those capabilities. And so, you know, a lot of, a lot of the capabilities and capacities that we have now with next generation manufacturing now in-house, we focus a lot of managerial attention and capital and making sure that, you know, that is really locked in and, and allows us to, 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 to really reap the benefits of, 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 you know, years and years of development work. But well, there are many other aspects in which um, you know, we, 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 we adopt this approach. I've listed examples there. I won't, I won't run through them all. Uh, but, but the point is, is um, it, it really fits together with the global overarching strategy of AstraZeneca, which is you know, co-location of its, its R&D sites in um, you know, technology clusters around, around the world. And, and finally, this piece around um, you know, strategic considerations and tactical activities, which you know we are, which I think are reflected in in, in a lot of the activities that we're, we're pursuing in this space, um, the, making sure that we you know don't we we, we don't uh, 
I guess, um, occupy the middle ground when it comes to reducing costs or differentiating performance. I think we've, you know, firmly planted our flag around, you know, reducing our costs. And this is reflected, for example, in some of the platforming of our processes, which we've, we've, which we've accomplished. Um, and finally, some around the tactical activities, and we're regularly looking at our investments and, 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 and what the, how effective they are, and making sure that we're guarding against some of these white elephants that um, you know, can, can occur. And, um, and, and of course, um, making sure that you know, there's good harmonization and alignment with um, what we're thinking of doing as, uh, as well as globally what, what's happening within the company. And you know, many, many um, collaborations um, that, that have allowed us to work effectively within next generation manufacturing. And um, I think that the, the, given the, the um, solid approach that, that AstraZeneca has applied, the, the future looks bright. So just a few uh, summary key points. You know, we've 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 touched, we've covered a lot of ground. And um, what what I hope that you can take away from this presentation is that you know there, there quite rightly there's a, a lot of pressure from society on drug pricing. It is ushering a new area, uh, is ushering in a new era of um, supply and production efficiencies. Um, continuous manufacturing is one of the key areas um, that, that I think are that, that I think is 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 coming along from that. Um, there are still many many powerful impediments which are restraining you know, progress and adoption. Um, AstraZeneca has a large variety of products which it needs to um, bring to market and you know, make a difference to patients' lives, and and it also needs to balance um, balance balance the cash as well as um, make sure that you know what what it's doing is is, is efficient and right, um, and 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 you know cost effective as well as you know attends attending to the in, uh, ESG in, in interests. Um, fully integrated processing work that we've done has has, has proven successful. We've published on that. Um, we see um, upgrading of our assets as as entirely achievable with minimal equipment equipment upgrading. Um, both within our manufacturing operation sites as well as within our development sites. And um, I think overall, the main point is that um, we are trying to push the boundaries of what is possible, you know, but we're doing that in a very economical and strategic, uh, collaborative way, very judicious manner. And, um, you know, the, the way, the way we're, we're doing it is, 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 is one which will, will, um, will be beneficial for the future, but it will also support um, our legacy. And I think with that, um, the presentation is complete. 